welcome. Thanks for having me. Can everybody hear me okay? Kelly, yeah? You're good. Great, okay. Um, I'm just uh, setting up my video here. Um, there we go. Okay, so my name is Ryan. I am uh, a uh, resident here in Beamsville uh, and an, an avid attendee of the library and an avid gardener uh, here in my uh, suburban backyard. Um, like I said, here on the west side of Beamsville. Um, today we're going to be talking about backyard beekeeping. Uh, I don't know if you guys were here for my backyard gardening um, seminar, but uh, it's kind of happening in the same place. Uh, I'll be talking out of my office here, and then if anybody's interested, we can go out and take a look at what's outside. Uh, but all of the content at this point will be uh, what you see on your screen. Um, so uh, we'll get right into it. Uh, my presentations are typically very picture heavy because I take a lot of pictures and I love them and, uh, and this is one of my chances to show off all my pictures. Uh, so what we'll be going through today is uh, backyard beekeeping with non-stinging native super pollinator solitary bees. These differentiate from honeybees in lots of ways and we'll be talking about that. Um, native solitary bees uh, don't make hives, uh, they don't sting, uh, and they're super pollinators. So those are the big three things about them. And um, we'll be talking about the benefits of that. We'll be talking about how to raise them. Um, th really, there's two ways. You can set it and forget it uh, and just let it do its thing, minimal uh, intervention, minimal effort required, or you could um, uh, do a little bit of manual intervention uh, to to help uh, help them along. So we'll talk about both. Um, <clears throat> and then at the end, of course, I'll talk about some of my references uh, and, and where I got my information, where I've learned all of my stuff uh, and, and how, I, how I got to the point where we're at here. Uh, this is a picture of uh, for my nephew, Mason. Uh, I made him a Mason bee box for his uh, birthday last year. Uh, so it's Mason's Mason bees in my, in my really cluttered garage. <clears throat> And all right, so what are native solitary bees? Um, the two main kinds that I use for gardening and for pollinating of my plants are mason bees and leafcutter bees. That's because they are very docile, very friendly bees that don't sting, they don't chase you, they don't swarm, they don't bother you uh, at the dinner table because they, they're after pollen. So they bounce from flower to flower and they go back and they live in, in these little bee houses on the fence that are uh, not very intrusive. They're not like those giant, um, well, you'll see a picture of them on the next slide uh, for honeybee hives. They are, um, they're just little birdhouses on the fence. Um, Mason bees are active pollinators in May and June uh, during the season and leaf cutters are July and August. So they're a perfect pair to work the whole season for you, pollinating all of your flowers. They don't sting because they don't have a hive to protect or a queen to protect. So they're very docile. The females are able to sting, but are so docile that it rarely ever happens. And males don't actually have stingers at all. Uh, so a very common misperception, uh, misconception when it comes to, to mason bees and leafcutter bees is that they sting just like other bees, but they don't. Uh, they live in small nesting materials like the size of a birdhouse and they're super pollinators. We'll talk about that later. It's super cool. Uh, versus honeybees. Honeybees are great too, um, but they're not actually a native bee species. They are an invasive species that were brought over from Europe. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, just saying that they are not from here. Um, they are, they're a hive based uh, bee. And as you can see, you know, standard hives with the honeycombs and the big boxes and stuff like that. They've got a, a queen when it's time, for, when the wild um, uh, beehives are looking for a new home, they, they, they will swarm to look for a new home and they make honey. None of these things happen with uh, native uh, solitary bees. <clears throat> Why do we do this? Uh, well, this is a picture of me and my kids uh, doing hand pollinating in the backyard this spring uh, because we have a, uh, we had a greenhouse over the uh, over the garden and we were uh, 
starting to get blossoms before the bees showed up because of the heat that was in the greenhouse. So we did a lot of hand pollinating with, with the, the paint brushes. But uh, that's one of the reasons we do this, so that the bees can pollinate everything for us rather than us having to do everything like that. Uh, our number one reason is to teach our kids how their food is made from plant to flower to fruit. Uh, and of course, to pollinate all the trees and, and vegetables and anything that's, that's blossom based uh, and, and then needs a fruit set uh, and needs a pollinator, uh, they, they would obviously help us. Uh, and then of course, you know, save the bees. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, important thing right now uh, with pesticides and bee populations declining all, all over the place. Anywhere that you can help the bees uh, would be awesome. So it was a couple of years ago that I thought, well, this will help us with our vegetable production out of our garden and, uh, you know, save the bees. So here we are a couple of years later with some experience under our belt uh, and, and lots of stories to tell. So, for example, uh, solitary bees are super pollinators. And this is a super cool stat. Mason bees are 19 times more efficient at pollination than a honeybee. That means if it takes 100 honeybees to pollinate this entire apple tree that you see here, it takes six mason bees. Uh, it, it's because um, of how they pollinate. So a honeybee is very precise about how they pollinate. They get right onto that blossom and then they use their super long tongue, I don't know the technical word for it, uh, to extract that nectar, which they take back to the hive. And they also grab the pollen and they stick it to the back of their legs and they bring that back to the hive. And I was reading, uh, sorry, watching a video about, about the difference between uh, these efficiencies and uh, a lot of the cross pollination for honeybees actually happens in the hive not out on the on the blossoms and a honeybee is programmed to go from its hive to a specific tree in an orchard and back to his hive back and forth back and forth until he's done with that whole tree and then he'll go to another tree and you can see how cross pollination would be very minimal in that case because you're not bouncing from tree to tree or from flower to flower so the way a mason bee or a leaf cutter bee does it is they just belly flop into the blossom right and they roll around they get as much pollen as they can and look at these little guys they are just awesome totally covered in pollen they're they're little hairy guys uh which is better for holding the pollen they bounce from flower to flower they are very indiscriminate about where they pollinate and this bouncing from flower to flower you know does the pollination for us and gets the you know the male parts on the female parts etc uh, so that we can have fruit set on our plants and uh, and have fruit and have food. Um, and that is what makes a mason bee or a leaf cutter bee or all of the native uh, solitary bees a, a 19 times more efficient at pollinating than a honeybee. Although you don't get honey, that's the one downside. So how to raise mason and leaf cutter bees? Um, there's, there's lots of different ways to do it. There's lots of different uh, tools you can do it with. You've probably seen some form of this at a hardware store or at um, uh, a garden center or something like that. Probably the bottom right one, those window containers, uh, or sorry, uh, the, uh, the retail pollinator houses are the ones that uh, you, you'd see the most at the stores. Um, you can have solid blocks of wood like this one where uh, holes are drilled into it. Uh, you can have these blocks of wood with the holes these reeds you can either have cardboard reeds or wooden reeds uh, these different slats are used for uh, either letting your uh, your cocoons out or, or or other stuff and then just random little spaces in the roof for um, different different insects to to live and breed um, this is a less controlled environment i mean anything can really go in there and and uh, make a home um, and i prefer to uh, have a little more intervention. But in, in cases like these, you can really just set it and forget it. You can put an empty one of these houses out on your fence, uh, and that will provide the uh, adequate environment for uh, a, a bee to come along and make a home uh, in, in a hole, or a wasp, or a yellow jacket, or um, any other manner of, of insect. And that's the difference between 
sort of set it and forget it and the managing of the population. So, um, oh, another cool thing that you can get is one of these bee observer nesting windows where half of the length of the hole is actually under plexiglass. So you can see what it looks like for that bee to go in there and uh, do its, its stuff in the hole, which we'll actually talk about next. So I prefer to make my own blocks. <clears throat> in the bottom left here is the blocks that I made this spring or reassembled this spring from last year. Um, and it's the block will itself just go into a house uh, on a wall, on a fence. Uh, they just prefer to have some nice warm morning sun in order to wake these little guys up uh, and then possibly some shade in the afternoon and definitely a roof so that they're not washed out by the rain. Um, some details about it, mason bees like eight millimeter holes versus leaf cutters like six millimeters because masons are uh, slightly larger than leaf cutters. And a fun fact is that bees can't do math. Uh, and the reason I mention that is because you'll notice all this scarring that I did with a blowtorch on the front of these blocks. That's to give it a unique look. If you are, are too precise, like I tend to be sometimes I'm super OCD about stuff like this, uh, a nice grid of eight by eight, um, the bee is going gonna, is gonna to come try and find its home and it's not going to remember, oh, right, I was the third level down and the fourth hole in. That's my home. It's not going to remember that. Um, so I started doing different uh, depths with the pieces of wood and um, and then of course I scarred it with the torch so that all of the holes try and have a unique look so they don't have to do math to remember which hole was theirs. Um, <clears throat> one of the big differences between what we make and what you can buy is, well, you can also buy these too, but uh, I'll go back a slide, is you'll notice these are solid holes. So once the bees go in there and lay their eggs and stuff, well, they're pretty much on their own. Um, with blocks like these, you can actually separate, uh, at the end of the season, you can separate along these lines and, uh, and see what's in there and what uh, nicely fully developed cocoons are in there for you to <clears throat> harvest and, and take care of uh, through the winter. So uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so these are my cousins, and, or sorry, these are my, my kids and uh, my, my nephew Mason over there. Uh, we all made bee houses uh, and uh, we've all got them hanging outside, uh, outside our houses. So the life cycle of a Mason bee, uh, let's talk about that. Uh, in April, May, um, it's mid-April-ish to latest would be the first week of May. You want to put your mason bee cocoons out. If, um, if you're starting with mason bees for the first time, you can buy them uh, from uh, locally a natural insect control in Stevensville. Uh, that's where I ended up getting mine. Uh, my first set of bee cocoons was actually through Wiffle Tree Farms uh, Nursery, where I got a whole bunch of garden stuff. Then at the, the last page of their pamphlet was... Uh, get more production out of your garden with mason bees. I was like, well, I'm interested in this. And that was my first year, but they were just a reseller of Nick. Um, so we're, we keep it local here in Niagara and um, I get, get them from natural insect control um, when I need them. So this year I needed them and, and there's a story behind that. But uh, so you'll get about 10 mason bee cocoons for about 20 bucks. Uh, and it's in their half male, half female. You can tell when they're cocoons because the, the males are significantly smaller than the females. Um, so you take your cocoons, uh, like I said, late April, and you put them in a little box of some kind, uh, kind of like the one on top of this block here. You cut a hole in the front of it um, and you put the cocoons in the box and you uh, let them outside. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, in your bee house, usually in the loft part of your bee house, you can see, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, right here, uh, I put it in the loft of the bee house here, and I just held it there with a piece of crumpled up newspaper so that the wind didn't blow it away because it's all very light stuff. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, one second. <clears throat> all right. So, we start with cocoons, and those cocoons go out in the little matchbox on the top there. And uh, your, a good guiding principle is that when the dandelions are in bloom and it's an average of 10 degrees Celsius during the daytime, you can put your mason bees out. 
Now, there are freak accidents that happen, and, well, we saw snow in Toronto on May 28th this year, um, so there was probably a lot of mason bees lost um, in, in those real cold, in that real cold snap in late May, which is unfortunate. Here down in, uh, in Beamsville, we stayed uh, relatively warm enough to, to not kill all the mason bees, which is good. Um, <clears throat> full sun in the morning to make them uh, in the morning to wake them up and sheltered from the rain. Uh, another um, thing, if it's a brand new block that you're using or a brand new house that you just bought from the store, I would suggest this uh, little product here called Mason Bee Attractant. It's called it's called Invita Bee. It's a tiny little spray bottle that holds that Mason Bee pheromone in it, and it lets the bees know when they wake up and they come out of this little hole here. Um, they it lets them know where to go oh there's a block down here with a bunch of mason bee pheromone on it maybe i'm gonna go make a nest here uh and and on the top you can uh, see the uh the window uh the bee window thing that uh, that i bought so yeah here we are the continued life cycle of a mason bee on the left we have one of our mason bee males who woke up they tend up they tend to wake up first uh, from when you take them out of cold storage, which is typically the crisper of your fridge, uh, or, or when you get them from the store, they're, they're kept cold and they're given to you on an ice pack. They're kept cold, so they stay dormant in their cocoons. Once they warm up to that 10 degrees, uh, they're going to start waking up out of their cocoons, and you're going to have buzzing in your little box, and you don't want that. Um, so they, the men wake up first after a few days. It only takes one or two days to wake up. And then they hang around the hole waiting, marking their scent. That's what those little beige marks are. And, uh, and then a female wakes up and that's what happens on the right. Um, the, the male's job is done at that point. So unfortunately the male dies after fertilizing a female. And so ends the life cycle of the male mason bee. The female on the other hand, has a big job to do. Um, she goes down and typically picks a hole uh, in the block. This is a, a picture that I got last year of one of my Mason Bee ladies uh, just hanging out at the front of her hole. It was super cool. She was so brave. I got really close in there with my camera uh, and she just hung out post for the picture. Um, and what happens in that hole is super cool and that's what I'm gonna talk about next. So <clears throat> this is kind of a cross section of the hole. Now, uh, these are the larvae at different stages of life. Um, but what I'm trying to illustrate here is if the back of the hole is on the right, then uh, the, the mama mason bee will come in here, go to the back of the hole, and she will lay an egg. She will then dust off a bunch of pollen that she got from bouncing around your um, your apple blossoms or whatever and and uh, to feed her little egg and then she will give that egg a gender hormone to determine what gender it is and um, they can actually do that which is super cool they can uh, and what they'll do is the the um, the babies at the back the eggs at the back they will give a female gender hormone and then the, uh, the, basically the back three or four, they will give a female gender hormone. And then the next three or four, because typically there's seven or eight uh, little uh, capsules uh, in, in a hole, uh, well, they will get a male hormone. So the back ones are females, the front ones are males. It's sort of a last in, first out kind of cue next spring. Um, in a natural cycle where there's no intervention by humans, um, what would happen is since the males wake up first, they are laid in the hole last and they get the first door out and they'll come out and wait around for a female to show up and, and then the cycle will continue. Um, it, it basically starts with an egg that is nourished by the pollen, then it turns into a larva, then it turns into uh, a partially developed uh, mason bee and then a fully developed mason bee uh, by the fall. Um, <clears throat> so the difference between masons and leaf cutters, other than their time of year that they work, their, te their temperature preference, their size, and their color, <laughs> they have a lot of things different, is they're called mason bees is because they actually use mud to separate the sections of their hole. 
So uh, they'll they'll seal uh, that little egg in there um, and then start on the next cell. And each cell is only about a centimeter, maybe like half inch, three quarter inch long. Um, and they'll fit seven or eight of them in one tube, separated with mud for mason bees. And leaf cutter bees use leaves. Uh, if you've got a, a, a healthy uh, block of, uh, of leaf cutter bees, you will start noticing little holes in some of your tree leaves here and there. Um, and these are for the benefit of the leaf cutter bees because they'll fly back to the hole and wrap their their uh, their pollen and their and their egg um, in with the leaves, and it's it's really cool. In the bottom right corner here, you can see a cross section of actually a mixed uh, block where there's leaf cutters at the top and masons on the bottom. Um, and I don't know what's going on in the middle there, but uh, the, the the top and bottom are masons and leaf cutters. Got that picture off the internet. <clears throat> so um, as time starts to go by, the, the weeks are passing now in May, and we're starting to see holes fill up on our block, uh, which is pretty awesome. That means we've got you know seven or eight developing mason bees for every one of those holes. And you'll remember we started with 10 cocoons, five males, five females. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 holes were filled by five females. That's an average of over three holes per female, which is great. Um, and so the picture on the left is my block. And then the picture on, my, on the right is uh, just different kinds of uh, nesting materials like the reeds. And there's a mason bee on the reeds in the top right there. Uh, but it's really neat to show the kids that, you know, holes are starting to fill up and then every now and then they'll see a bee on the, on the block, walking around, doing a little dance or something. Uh, so the kids love it. So the Mason bee life cycle is from, honey, I'm, I'm talking to a lot of people right now. Uh, no, I, I do want to sing. Uh, anyway, <laughs> this is my daughter, Thea. Um, everybody, Thea. Thea, everybody. Okay, you gotta go, honey. I'll answer your question later. Um, go ask mommy or Grandy or Grammy, please. Okay. Um, okay, so the life cycle of a Mason bee will start at release, let's say the last week of April. They will go until probably the last week of June-ish, mid-June uh, till it gets too hot. Uh, so they've, uh, the, the female mason bee has about an eight to 10 week life cycle. And in that life cycle, they will fill up as many holes as they can uh, for the next generation. And, uh, and then it's our job, and this is where the intervention comes in. You could, you could do nothing. You're more than welcome to just leave it there. And they will mature in that block all summer. And then they will go dormant and hibernate over the winter. They'll survive. Uh, and unless they get attacked by spider mites, a predatory wasp uh, uh, or, or something like that that could go in and, and kill the whole colony. Uh, so this is where the intervention part comes in. And when you start noticing that there's no more holes being filled, you would take the block out of the box, you would wrap it in um, a, a mesh bag here. Uh, one of the products uh, that I use is, is Bee Guard from Crown Bees. Um, and I take it and I just put it in my garage. It's, an, it's a regular garage, unheated, uh, because those larvae need the heat of the summer to develop into fully developed uh, bees inside those cocoons. And then so by around October, they are fully developed bees in cocoons in those blocks. We haven't touched them yet. We just moved them out of their box into a mesh bag so they don't get attacked by other things. Um, and around October, is when it gets really interesting, we open up the blocks. And as you can see here, this is last, this is two years ago, uh, we got a whole lot of mason bee cocoons in our blocks. Uh, I must have taken this picture while I was half done uh, cleaning them because there's some missing ones there. But uh, the, the picture on the left is the separated panels in, in that block of wood. Um, the, the holes are actually drilled right on the seam between the woods so that you can separate them and uh, you can reveal the, the 
mason bee cocoons inside um and then you would gently scrape these guys out into like a tupperware or something like that and kind of gently wash them with some water they're waterproof cocoons as long as you're gentle with them um and yeah you you kind of collect them and here's a picture of them all cleaned up uh, i ended up starting with that 10 uh mm -hmm. that year and i got 165 in october it was a very successful year for me um and uh yeah we took them we gave them a light wash i put them in a piece of uh plastic um a plastic case um and uh, with a sponge that i kept uh, a little bit uh, moist throughout the winter i ended up putting them in the crisper of my beer fridge in the basement uh and they 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 went all winter uh maybe once a month i'd go down there and put a few drips of water on the sponge just to keep everything moist um but we take them and we put them in the fridge to simulate winter and they stay dormant uh and and they're they're totally fine uh what i actually did at this point and i don't have a picture of it was i went through and i separated the male cocoons from the females put them in the same thing and i separated them with a pencil so that next spring i knew which ones were the males and females and depending on what i was going to do with them i sent equal proportions of each so what i did end up doing and this is last year uh just over a year ago i um <clears throat> I ended up getting another house. I put two houses on the fence. I put 40 in this house. And then I was gonna do 40 in this house, but then I was like, wait, I'm gonna give some to my father-in-law. I'll give some to my nephew, Mason, um, and so on. And then this cold snap hit in mid-May of last year. I don't know if uh, you guys remember, but it killed everybody's Mason bees, except for this guy, because I procrastinated on that second box uh, of Mason bees uh, and they were still inside, in the crisper of my beer fridge. So after that cold snap, uh, I ended up being able to put out my last bit of surviving bees from the 165, my last 20 uh, cocoons went out uh, and I ended up getting a full block from them, which was awesome. Brought them into the, um, uh, into the garage uh, last fall. And then around Christmas time, I heard like a buzzing in the garage. I looked at the bag and there was a predatory wasp inside the mesh bag with the block. So I squished him as soon as I saw him, uh, but it was too late. He had had a, an absolute feast and, and ended up eating all of the uh, baby mason bees. <clears throat> and that's the story of why I had to go to Nick and buy mason bee cocoons this spring. Uh, and we started all over again this April. Uh, and I had released them uh, in May of this year. So <clears throat> there's, there's success stories and there's failures and there's ups and downs, uh, but uh, all around it's worth it um, <clears throat> to, to get into mason bees. I did notice a significant increase in pollination in the garden, a significant increase in the produce that I got out of my garden out of the same space, same number of plants. Uh, we were just turning more flowers, more blossoms into fruit. Uh, it, so it was pretty awesome. That was the, that year. Uh, uh, I guess it was uh, last year, right? Yeah. Okay, so just a, a quick review of the life cycle of mason bee. Uh, the males basically wake up in March and die in April. <laughs> the females wake up just shortly after the males. They pollinate, they lay eggs through to June, I would say into mid-June in, in uh, cooler climates. Uh, and then they die. And then the larva in the block, they go spin their cocoon through the summer, have their metamorphosis, uh, and then they go into hibernation and dormancy. And it's at this point where we can intervene if we want and uh, take them out, keep them in our, our, our beer fridge uh, crisper. Uh, otherwise, like I said, you could set it and forget it and still benefit the bees just by putting out some nesting materials and see what happens. Um, the, one of the more attractive things to me was that these are non-stingers. I've got four kids playing around in the backyard. They've got friends coming and going, not so much during COVID, but um, I don't want to be responsible for my bees stinging anybody's kids. And that just won't happen with these guys. So it was a win-win for everybody um, <clears throat> uh, to get mason bees. And then uh, it, I'll be releasing my leaf cutter bees uh, shortly, actually, because it's it's quite warm outside. And then we'll uh, we'll do it all over again with uh, with leaf cutters. So in summary, the benefits are super pollination, which will increase the yields of your garden and fruit trees. We're helping the bee population. Uh, they're non-stingers. 
Uh, masons are May and June, leaf cutters are July and August, so they're a great tandem act together. Uh, successful blocks will multiply a lot. And the cool thing about that is if you've got, don't know what to do with all these Mason bee cocoons because you had such a successful year, uh, there's bee buyback programs available at places like Natural Insect Control um, where they will pay you for your mason bees. And you'll make that $20 back in one season two or three times, uh, depending on how many cocoons you get. Um, but uh, I never end up doing that, obviously. I spread them around friends and family. Um, but that's, that's an option if, uh, if you want to make some money or make some money back. Uh, like I said, you can set it and you, or you can forget it. Uh, uh, you can set it and forget it, or you can manage it yourself, uh, depending on how much time you have or how, much children, how many children you have taking up all of your time. Some references, obviously natural insect control uh, is out of Stevensville. They've got a whole lot of fun stuff there. They are a reseller of Crown Bees uh, materials. Crown Bees uh, is, is a really good uh, company out of the States. Unfortunately, they don't deliver to Canada unless you're a retailer. So you can't get stuff directly from Crown Bees delivered to Canada, but you can get it from Nick. Uh, and uh, Nick has tons of different stuff if you if you want ladybugs to control your aphid population if you want uh, mason bees if you want uh giant praying mantises they've they've got them uh crownbees.com also has a lot of instructional videos and uh reminder emails of when to put things out uh and stuff like that i'm on all of those mailing lists and uh i've got a lot of stuff going on in all the different gardens so it's great to be told hey it's time to put your leaf cutter bees out the only reason I know that is because I got that email yesterday. Um, and then, of course, uh, myself, uh, I run a social media channel on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube called My Niagara Garden. It features all of the stuff that I do around the yards uh, with the kids. Uh, sometimes after the kids go to bed, I have to do it with lights on. Uh, I'm that crazy guy on the front lawn uh, with a headlamp uh, gardening <laughs> when the sun's gone down. Um, but uh, if you are on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, uh, please uh, feel free to follow me at my Niagara garden. Uh, I'll be linking to the video of this uh, presentation and I'll be, you know, telling lots of stories and, uh, and doing uh, features on different things around the garden, uh, including um, backyard beekeeping, which is what we're talking about today. So I think I accidentally did two slides of that. And here's my inquisitive bee for the question period. Thank you, Ryan, for that overview um, of the adventures in backyard beekeeping. <laughs> it sounds like a lot of uh, sometimes a little bit finicky, but that's like with anything like exactly uh, lots of ups and downs, um, but more ups and downs. Absolutely. Does anyone if anyone has any questions, please feel free to pop them into the chat or experiences if you've tried this before. OK, so our first question is uh, where in a garden or backyard would be the best place to place a block? And if you're familiar with permaculture, how do you integrate this with your system? Um, so the best place to put your block is uh, kind of like a south facing surface. Uh, so I guess it would be, no, it would be an east facing surface. Sorry. So you get that morning sun. I have uh, the way the sun works around my place is that the sun gets over the house and it goes right on that back fence. So that's where I put the, the bee house. And then as it, as the sun goes past the, 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 it gets a bit of shade in the afternoon. So that morning sun is important uh, for these little guys to warm them up, to energize them so that they can get uh, get their day going. Uh, like we need our cup of coffee, they need that sunshine in the morning to wake them up. Uh, when it comes to permaculture, I, I don't actually know uh, too much about permaculture and how it would integrate into a permaculture system. That's my next uh, foray into gardening is permaculture. Uh, but I imagine I would take these little bees with me uh, on that adventure. Perfect. Uh, Robin's got her hand up, so I'm going to just uh, ask Robin to unmute if you want to just ask your question, um, or I think I, you may just pop it in the chat. So um, Robin is asking, if you don't have a secondary fridge, can you keep them in a shed? Uh, yeah, that's totally fine. Um, I would worry that if it gets too cold outside, it might deep freeze these guys and actually kill them over the winter, like minus 25s, uh, the, 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 the super colds. We don't typically hit that down here in Niagara. Um, but if you're farther north, uh, that might be a problem. Uh, once again, it all has to do with the, the control factor. Uh, if uh, even if uh, you keep it in your regular fridge um, at the back, you know, uh, not disturbed, as long as it's in a sealed plastic container with some air holes, uh, you're not going to get any uh, bees waking up. 
because you're keeping them at about three degrees in your fridge. They will stay dormant uh, and, and totally fine. Uh, I just keep mine in my beer fridge because there's less traffic at the beer fridge. I've got four little kids and they're constantly in and out of the uh, uh, in and out of the fridge grabbing stuff. So the bee cocoons get a little more peace in the basement. Uh, but yeah, um, like I said, I, I, I'm not sure if I would let go of the control of putting them outside, uh, maybe in the garage where it might not get as cold as the outside outside shed, um, but if possible, the fridge. Perfect. Are there any plants or flowers that um, these bees prefer, like that you could plant in your garden to encourage the pollination and whatnot? So when um, when I first put my bees out, uh, the masons, there, there's not a lot of blossoms happening in late April, right? But there is the Easter lily, which is a nice big flower with lots of pollen on on the uh, on the insides of that flower. Is that the pistil or the stamen? I forget what they're called. But I will typically take my uh, my old Easter lily from Easter weekend and keep it and and hang it right next to the bee house so that those uh, mama bees waking up if they don't have anything to find pollen they've got that easter lily right there they can jump and do a belly flop into perfect um do they need to be protected while pollinating like do they attract predators like wasps uh they do not attract predators uh, uh like wasps uh there will be naturally occurring wasps in your neighborhood um uh, and in your garden, I mean, I, I saw this quote earlier this week, which was pretty cool. If you don't have any pests in your garden, your garden isn't interacting with nature and it's not part of the ecosystem. So I thought that was kind of cool. I'm like, yeah, it, it, I get pretty crazy about pests and stuff in the garden, but you know, sometimes you just gotta let it happen. Um, but I do know that they don't attract uh, more pests to the garden like wasps and things like that, especially like the block itself. Um, when you're talking about wasps, uh, they need, they, they make that, um, you know what a wasp nest looks like, right? Uh, they make that multi-celled um, honeycomb type of thing. Uh, and they can't make that in the nesting materials of a bee house. Uh, they need to find a place under a fence or, or somewhere tight like that. But the six millimeter holes are too tight for wasps. Perfect. Um, so if anyone has any more questions, feel free to pop them uh, into the chat. I see Kay Gable is putting his hand up in the video. Oh, yes. Go, go uh, ahead. Uh, you can unmute if you'd like. Oh, sorry. You just muted yourself. Uh, there, there you go. There. Okay. Um, I've been doing uh, what I call my pollinator palace for a few years now. It's about a, a, a one and a half by two foot box. And I've individually cut bamboo shoots. Uh, various sizes, but really small ones. Um, and basically every year the leaf cutters and the mason wasps, mason bees have all mudded and, 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 and filled up all the holes. Yeah. My question for you is, um, and they just start emerging in the spring. Yep. Um, when can I clean them out? Like uh, to, to make the, the shoot, because I went through every bamboo shoot when I first put it together and I reamed it out with a quarter inch bit, right? Yeah. 300 yeah, times is quite a bit. So when can I ream them back out? Do I got to wait for every one of those holes to open up? Yeah, that's a tough one, eh? Because when you set out naturally, um, naturally happening um, uh, nesting materials, they're going to be emerging and, you know, reoccupying holes at the same time. The men are going to come out, the females are going to come out, and then, then the females are going to start nesting in, in empty ones at the same time. So how are you supposed to know which ones are empty and spent and which ones are not. Um, so that's why uh, that's why I do it in the in the fall when I know they're in there and they are uh, dormant. But you can't really get them out without killing them all, uh, <laughs> unless it's one of those blocks where you can separate the holes. Or sometimes you can get the, the cardboard reeds that are actually spiral, and then you uh, in the fall you pinch it and and you turn it like a, a toilet paper roll or a paper towel roll you know when you grab the end of the paper towel roll and you twist it it opens up yep. in a spiral so you can get uh, paper reeds that will do that and open up for you in that way so you don't have to buy or build the blocks and you can yeah. just yeah i was just gonna say do you think that i should just leave it be yeah just leave it out there and they come when they come and they if they don't they don't okay good 
Good. Yeah, at Thanks. this point, I know what you're trying to do. You're sort of trying to leave it and help clean and uh, do some housekeeping for them at the same time. But yeah. I think it's kind of like an all or nothing. Uh, and at this point, it would be best to just leave them be, let them enjoy the materials you put out there for them. Uh, and if you want to start a controlled system, uh, now would be the time to start it for leaf cutters uh, or next spring for masons. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't hear you there. That okay, thank you. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Um, so, um, Caroline was wondering if they make honey, but I don't believe they do because they're not honeybees, correct? No, they don't make honey. Uh, they just make babies uh, in the holes uh, and they make fruit and flowers uh, pollinate for us. Uh, there's, there's no honey with these guys. Um, that's, that's just honeybees, really. Perfect. And uh, Miranda's wondering approximately when in July uh, do the leaf cutters go out? Soon, actually, I, I got my reminder e email from Crown Bees uh, earlier this week. Uh, I looked up the specific temperature that the leaf cutters like, and that's 24 degree average temperatures during the day, which is right now. Perfect. And Jen is wondering if you have any tips for carpenter bees. Um, so if you put out a bee house like this, would it stop them from digging into her deck? Yeah, see, carpenter bees are, are not uh, as friendly. Um, and poor mason bees and, and leafcutter bees often get confused with carpenter bees. Actually, I posted about this talk about a month ago uh, and, uh, on social media somewhere. And one of my comments was, how could you cultivate these little devils? They're tearing my deck apart. And I, uh, I replied, I'm like, I think you might be talking about carpenter bees. The masons get a bad rap because of that. Um, they, they don't tear up your deck. Carpenter bees do. They look like bumblebees. Uh, they're much bigger, fuzzier, rounder. Um, uh, but they're more like a black and white rather than a bumblebee, which is a black and yellow. Uh, they do make their homes out of blocks of wood. They make their own holes, which is like the carpenter ant. The carpenter bee uh, has the same... Uh, talent and that is to dig holes in the things uh, i had a bunch of them last year two years ago when i first put up a whole bunch of new posts in my garden and i saw them drilling in there and i was like uh that's not good so uh what i did to prevent it actually was i uh, i filled the hole there wasn't any carpenter bee in there but uh i filled it with uh, a, a a crafting glue gun and i filled it up patched the hole and uh they never came back and we're talking like a dozen different holes within a five foot radius. And I just filled them all up and they never came back. I had them on the side of my pergola, filled those up, they never came back. So that seemed like a good deterrent at the time. Maybe I got lucky, I don't know, um, but that's, that's what worked for me. Perfect. And um, so what, if, they're, if they're not making honey, what is it that they're feeding the babies? Is it po the pollen? Yes, it's the pollen and a little bit of ne nectar as well. Um, mason bees do collect some nectar, just not with the, that ninja precision of, an, of a honeybee. Um, they, they're basically 90% pollen, 10% nectar, bring it back to the hole, feed it to the egg sort of thing. Perfect. And Caroline is wondering, um, do you do honeybees, which I don't believe you do, but would you or what, do you have any plans for honeybees? If I had more property and I wasn't in, a, I, I love my backyard, it's, it's nice, uh, uh, but if I had more property, I would do, probably do honeybees at the back. Um, I've got neighbors that I don't want to upset um, and, and stuff like that. I just feel like there's not enough space to do honeybees for me, although it's a pretty nice like lot that I'm on. Um, I, I, I'm very sensitive to bothering neighbors and things like that. I already have a bunch of gardens that <laughs> might annoy them, so I won't bug them with honeybees. Perfect. Um, so does anybody have any further questions? I don't see any hands or if you want to just pop them into the, the chat on the side there. Um, Annie is wondering about um, the optimum months for the bees. Um, and is there a way to determine this for different provinces that have different, maybe a cooler climate? Um, so that's why I, um, I always give advice by temperature, not by date. Um, so here in, in, Niagara, um, we might hit an average daily temperature of 10 degrees in mid-April uh, or early April, whereas in Manitoba, that's not going to happen until late June. Um, so yeah, I would really go by the temperature rather than by the actual date. Uh, and for mason bees, 10 degrees. For leaf cutters, 24 degrees. Uh, one other note is that um, leaf cutters 
don't uh, take a much take a much longer time to wake up. I said mason bees like one or two days later you'll start seeing little guys walking around. Leaf cutters are like a week, maybe two weeks uh, later before they start waking up. And in some of those cases, you actually have to wrap the the box that has your cocoons in it with the hole in it, remember that at the beginning of this uh, process, you have to wrap that in one of those mesh bags so that those cocoons that are still dormant and sitting out there in, you know, right now, uh, they don't get attacked by another predatory wasp or something like that. So you would uh, uh, sort of tie the drawstring on that mesh bag. And then after a few days, maybe a week, maybe a week and a half, you'll start seeing little bees significantly smaller than the masons uh, and usually green um, buzzing around in that mesh bag. And that's when you want to open that drawstring and let them out. Uh, you're done protecting them while they're uh, still asleep in their cocoons. And Vicky is wondering if you sell bee houses. <laughs> no, no I, I don't sell them. Um, uh, what's it called? Crown Bees sells those blocks. Uh, they are, they're awesome. They're better than anything I could make. Um, they do uh they don't ship to canada but nick uh natural insect control has them for sale uh and i would i would suggest those uh, i've done a bunch of research and watched a lot of videos on people using them and they're very happy with them <clears throat> uh the ones i make are you know there's a lot of user error i call it love carpenter love put into them uh but uh yeah i i would be too nervous to sell them because then they would have to be perfect <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, um, I have. Uh, there's another question that I had uh, asked of me when I when I posted this recently, and that was, do uh, the blocks provide nests for things like wasps and yellow jackets and things like that? And I may have answered this question already before, but I just wanted to reiterate that um, there's no danger for kids putting out mason bees in a block like this. Um, for you're not increasing the risk of, uh, risk of, of stinging children um, by putting out mason bees. Um, that was the big concern of this person. They wanted to do this, but they've got kids and uh, they didn't want to have anyone stung. So, I mean, there's always going to be stinging insects around. I'm not saying that the, 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 your kids aren't going to get stung, but having a block uh, with mason bees in it is not going to increase that risk. Thank you. Um... Any further questions if anyone uh, wants to pop into the chat? Um, as I, Ryan mentioned, uh, he'll be sharing some resources. So I will be sending a follow up email tomorrow with some library books and um, the link to for Ryan's Instagram. He's got lots of great content there. Make sure you're following him. The full recording of this video will be going up on our library YouTube channel, which will also be linked in the email. Um, just to talk about a few things coming up at the library, um, the last talk in our backyard series, as I've dubbed it for <laughs> while we're all staying close to home, uh, is backyard bird watching, which is coming up next Wednesday, July, June 16th at 6.30. And that's with Carla Carlson, a naturalist based out of Vineland, who will be talking about, you know, some of the birds you can see and whatnot in here in Niagara and how to be a bird-friendly community. And we've also got our summer reading club information coming up. Uh, that'll be out on Monday. So lots of good stuff. Um, fresh air, in-person, small group programs are on the radar, which will be nice. The library is open. If you don't have a library card, I encourage you to get one. There's a ton of great stuff. Um, we've got great speakers like Ryan, lots of online resources and books to cover you for the rest of your life. Um, so I'll also include that link in the email tomorrow. And I just see one more question came in from uh, Melissa. So this year one could begin with leafcutter bees any day and you'd wait till next spring for mason bees. Uh, yeah, definitely. It's, it's way too late for mason bees. They're pretty well done at this point. Uh, and leaf cutters are now. Um, I haven't got mine out. They're still downstairs uh, sharing the cool with my beer, uh, but they'll be going out either tonight or tomorrow. Uh, yeah, not, not very long at all. Um, one other thing uh, I should mention while I have everybody here is that uh, the garden is really starting to burst. Uh, in July, August timeframe is really when it is just this botanical jungle, which is amazing. Uh, and I typically post like a garden tour now on YouTube, and then I'll do another one in August. And uh, Kelly and I were talking about maybe doing a live tour here uh, so we can talk about all the different things we've got growing in the garden with the help of the pollination of the masons and the leaf cutters. Uh, so maybe that could be something we could do together 
in August, maybe another backyard series item. Absolutely. If you haven't uh, checked out Ryan on uh, Instagram, definitely do. His backyard is an oasis. Um, his sets <laughs> are very high for and side yard and front yard. Yeah, you take it over with uh, all the green spaces, but it's yeah. uh, definitely worth a follow. Um, just to kind of see all his adventures in gardening and whatnot. Cool. That's it for questions. We're going to wrap up for the evening because I know it's uh, cooling off a little bit outside, so we might be able to actually not swelter. Um, as I said, watch for the email tomorrow, which will have some follow-up resources from Ryan and myself. But thank you once again for joining us, and thank you, Ryan, for sharing your adventures in backyard beekeeping. You're always welcome. Good to, always good to chat. And uh, as I mentioned, next week we've got bird watching with Carla. If anyone would like to sign up, I added the registration link uh, in the chat. But thank you once again and have a good evening and happy beekeeping. Good luck. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.